Hello everybody, the pollinator here. It has truly been a hot minute since I've made a video about life, about my transition, about anything at all except for ID stuff and things relating to my group. Um, but I just wanted to check in and let everybody know what's been going on for me, uh, why it has been so long since I made a video. Um, basically, uh, things were just going great. Um, I was on fire. Um, I was really having an awesome transition. I still am, but life sometimes happens. And of course it has happened uh, to me. And uh, first thing was that um, after I spoke at the uh, Thea conference last year, the uh, presidential election happened, and I was pretty freaked out about those results, even though I saw it coming. I literally saw what was going on as it was happening, and I just knew Trump the chump was going to end up as the president of the United States. Um, that sent me on a, that sent me reeling because, um, probably six months prior to that, um, I had been on kind of a tangent. I wouldn't even say kind of, I literally was on a tangent about, um, being, uh, one of the only races in this country that is truly been oppressed for over 400 years. The other race in this country that has been so has been the uh, American Indians. But I had definitely been on a tangent. I scared a lot of people um, because I'm very blunt to the point and I really don't give a fuck who thinks what about me. So I was definitely um, getting into it with a lot of white people uh, on Facebook and um, trying to educate them. But as we all know, as black people in America, they ain't never going to get it. What oppression is like, um, because they don't even get it that they're privileged. Um, every single one of them. I could uh, spout off statistics and pop up with a bunch of links to show you um, how much of a spread there is in this country uh, from being white anything. I don't care if you're trans, gay, lesbian, bisexual, asexual. I don't care what you are. You still have it better off in this country than any black person here. And, and that's including uh, rich ones, because we can't get rich enough in this country, uh, considering the systematic uh, oppression that is going on uh, in the United States of America. And we know it. We're just not even really waiting for uh, white people to wake up, but it sure would be nice if y'all did, because then you could go to bat and um, uh, begin to educate your fellow man, if you care to, um, about why um, uh, privilege um, of the nature that it is in this country is so wrong. Um, I come from a place in my background where uh, there is abundance on the planet and that people needn't be so afraid to let other people rise. In fact, um, you know, in business, when you have a bunch of happy employees, they make your company soar. If they're happy, they go over and beyond uh, to help the people at the top become successful. And when they're not, they make it go under, basically. Um, not that any black person in this country or any group of us, given the current circumstances, can cause 
uh, the privileged race to go under. We, we cannot. Um, the only thing we can hope for basically is maybe reparations uh, to have our own states in the United States instead of being pigeonholed in this system that will never, ever, ever let us thrive. Anyway, I was on that tangent for a quite a while before the election happened. And then when it did, it was like, oh, no, now we're really going to have a mess to clean up. And it's not even our mess. We're just caught up in it. Um, so anyway, that happened. And I got very worried about what it's going to mean for uh, me as a trans man in the future. Um, whether or not the uh, right wing small minority of white people will actually get away with undoing uh, everything that Obama uh, created. I think there's enough checks and balances in the system and enough people right now who are looking at this clown and going, oh, I don't think so. We're not going to let him uh, or his crew uh, that he's putting in the White House um, totally drag this country back 40 years. I, I really don't think they're going to let that happen, but who knows? I mean, the the push to create war, um, all, all of that stuff. Uh, we would never win a fight like that. Never in a million years. They have the military, the militia, the KKK, other white supremacists that are highly trained, lots of modern weapons, and the only thing that would happen as a result of some kind of a civil war in this country is for the undesirables to be wiped out. That's what would happen, folks. So we don't even want to even go to those lengths. And I, I think there's enough uh, Americans in this country who would not let it go there uh, to, to that degree. Um, I'm just hoping. <laughs> But, uh, so that happened. And then, um, people that I had loved and admired, um, who stood for me, stood for what I stand for, who I am. Uh, one of them, a teacher that I knew in the high school that I graduated from, she passed away. Um, I went to her funeral and ran into a childhood friend which was just amazing. I, I, I couldn't have, even in that woman's uh, transition, she blessed me with running into my old friend. Um, I grew up with her. I grew up with her brother and her sisters. And her father is my father's best friend on the planet. So imagine that happening in the midst of my uh, grieving the loss of this teacher. Um, and then uh, my first cousin passed away unexpectedly. Uh, she's a, she's a same, she was the same age that I am. Um, that, that was truly devastating. And I wrote a tribute to her after I found out um, on Facebook, but I was truly, um, I don't know, as you get older, uh, mortality is more of an issue than when you're young. Um, but I, you know, start looking around and thinking, wow, <laughs> you know, if, if this, that kind of stuff can happen. Um, it can happen to anybody. And, um, so she made a trip up to heaven. And uh, then I had a um, hernia surgery. Um, I had two old hernias that uh, resurfaced when I moved to Atlanta and they weren't much of a problem, but in the last year or so, they began to bother me. I also wanted to uh, work out again and could not because I was afraid that the hernias would uh, break through the lining of my stomach. So I uh, had the Veterans Administration remove them 
and um, that was okay. But the next day was a complete nightmare for me. Um, I happened to get that surgery on snow day. And if anybody knows anything about Atlanta, <laughs> they can't handle snow here at all. It didn't even snow really. I mean, there was some stuff on the windows uh, that next Saturday, but they decided to all not come back to work. And the only staff that was left there was um, an emergency staff and they could not handle anything that was going on that day. It took me from 11 o'clock in the morning when the doctor told me that I would be discharged to 11.30 at night for me to actually get home. It was ridiculous. It was so ridiculous that uh, I contacted my um, congressman. I also contacted the patient advocates and the director's office at the VA to attempt to make sure that never, ever happens again. Of course it's going to happen because the VA, the VA has a reputation of uh, being inefficient and um, the uh, government has just has not gotten them together and the Atlanta Metro has, uh, well, the uh, center in Decatur uh, services everybody that's in Georgia. So there's probably, you know, hundreds of thousands of veterans that go to that uh, VA. And so it's, it's, it's overrun with people and it's not staffed very well. And many of the um, employees uh, are not employees, they're contractors that actually work at other hospitals in the area and other practices. So uh, most of them aren't even veterans either. So they're not necessarily uh, empathetic or sympathetic or patriotic uh, towards veterans. And I, I think that is true uh, all over the United States. But it's uh, especially true at this particular VA because there's just so many veterans going to it. Um, so, at any rate, so then I had surgery. And while I was uh, trying to recover, my only sister, my dear sister, passed away. And um, I try not to get emotional here. But uh, it happened on January 27th of this year. And um, I'm still reeling from that. I'm still grieving over her. Um, she'd been sick for a long time. <clears throat> and um, I knew it was gonna happen. Um, it's just, it's one thing to, to know something's going to happen and then to have it happen is completely different. Um, so I'm going to end up going home for the first time in over 11 years as a man. And I have a lot of mixed emotions about that. Um, my entire family knows uh, that I'm transitioning um, but it still gives me a little anxiety um, to be going home again uh, for the first time in over a decade um, so folks you know life got real got real real for me and um, I still consider myself fortunate um, and one of the reasons why is because as I talk to many, many, many people uh, that I do on a regular basis, um, I realized that being older, um, I'm, I'm not trying to grow up and figure life out and figure out who I am and how to, how to succeed in this country while transitioning at the same time. See, I did not have to do that. I had already been through a lot of stuff in my life. I already know who I am. 
Um, I even know my purpose on this planet. And I didn't have to be growing up and be transitioning at the same time, which is, I think, why I see so much um, strife coming from the transgender community because many people have not gotten through all their stuff before they start transitioning. So you add a powerful steroid like testosterone or um, a HRT like estrogen that actually takes you kind of the other direction and that coupled with life is a very, very difficult thing. That's why this wasn't really a choice for me. I wouldn't have chosen to do this for anything in the world. It's tough. Uh, only the weak survive. Only the strong strive um, th through something like this. And if you're not strong going into it, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be so challenging that you'll wonder sometimes, well, did I make a mistake? I know I didn't make a mistake um, because I had researched this uh, being a trans man for three years before I actually did anything about it. Um, I did start to do something about it after two years of research, but I wanted to make doggone sure that I wasn't taking this lightly at all. I mean, I'm getting uh, lesbian studs, basically, who come to me and um, talk about what they want testosterone to do for them that has nothing to do with being a man, has to do with looking like one, in a way, because it does change your body. Um, uh, you might sound like one because your voice may get lower. Although there are some trans men that I've watched videos of that their voice didn't hardly change at all. So it's not a guarantee that your voice will change. Um, it's also not a guarantee that you'll build muscle. I have a, a, a I know of a trans man that um, his muscle comes and goes. You know, you have to you have to work out. You want your body to look like a man, work out like men do. I mean, that's how they do it. They don't, uh, they've already, uh, I'm talking about cis males um, who already have testosterone in their system. But um, people are getting on testosterone for the wrong reasons. They are. Um... This is the biggest life-altering change that you may ever go through in your life. So you better be doggone sure you've done your homework, you've done your research, you've talked to people about it, and it doesn't matter how long it takes for you to embrace this way of life. It doesn't matter how long it takes. What matters is that you do. And that you're not just jumping on this bandwagon because it's trendy. Some trend. I mean, you're stepping into a world at a time where we are the target. Like the LGB was back in the 70s and 80s. So don't kid yourself. This isn't a cakewalk. And it isn't to be taken lightly at all. There are risks about being on testosterone that you need to know about. And I'm not even going to tell you what they are. I'm going to leave it up to you to research it. Um, you need to know all those things. You need to have a therapist. Because this is going to take you on an emotional ride. And, you know, if you get a therapist just so you can get the paper, the letter to get on testosterone and then dump your therapist, you're doing yourself a disservice, your family a disservice, your partner a disservice. In fact, if you do have a partner, you're going to put everything that happens to you onto that one person. Because you may not have the wherewithal to get support around you. So the only support you got is your partner. And I see it all the time where that poor partner is in pain over your transition because they're the only one 
you're talking to and taking things out on and going on this emotional roller coaster ride with. And you ain't got no support around you. You got a person here, a person there, but you really aren't tight with them. So your poor partner gets it. I haven't met one yet that didn't say they didn't go through hell uh, while their partner, their male partner was transitioning. And I don't know if the same happens for uh, male to females, but, it, you know, this is something you have to consider that it's not just about you. It's going to affect you and everyone around you. You're going to lose people in your life. You're going to gain other people. Some people have had to completely recreate their family unit. Uh, not to be of blood because the blood abandoned you. So you have to have the strength and the courage and the openness to reach out to people who are not your blood um, so that you can find self-acceptance before you find, try to get others to accept you. That's where I was when I embraced this is that I had embraced it. I didn't expect anybody else to. I didn't care if they did. I embraced it and that's all that mattered to me. If I lost everybody, I would have been okay. Why? Because I loved who I am. I didn't expect everybody else to love me. As long as God loves me, I love me. That's all that really mattered. So I proceeded to get support around me right after I started testosterone. Um, I go to uh, local groups here in the Atlanta metro, and I'm beginning to build a network of people. While I still pollinate others, because I learned long ago uh, the quickest way to get out of myself and to get out of my head and to get out of my shit and not to be uh, depressed and whining and all about myself is to help others. That's just how I do it. You know, some people think is, you know, I spend too much time on Facebook or whatnot. They don't even know what I'm doing on there. I, I do at least five different things at one time uh, while I'm on Facebook. I'm also all over the internet reading articles. I read a lot. Um, I watch a lot of videos. I participate in articles. I participate in politics. I participate in a lot of different things at one time because I'm a very fast typist. Very fast. I, in fact, I can't even stand texting because I got drug kicking and screaming into the smartphone world. I didn't, I didn't get my first smartphone until the beginning of 2015. Um, until then, I just typed, you know, that's, that was, uh, the second job I ever had in life, uh, was to type. So, you know, when you type like 110 words per minute and then you're reduced to texting when I can only text with this finger. <laughs> so I don't like to text at all. Um, at any rate, uh, Typing that fast affords me to do many things at the same time um, while I'm using my computer. And um, so i um, trying to think if there's anything I wanted to express. Um, mm, not at this time, but um, I'll probably make try to make another video um, before I uh, go home. And um, I just wanted to let everybody to know that, let everybody know that I'm okay. I'm, I'm considering losing my sister. Um, I'm doing pretty good. I, I go in and out of not even knowing where I am when I'm out there on the road um, because I'm just so distracted and um, I think about her all the time. I also wrote a tribute to her um, on Facebook, and, um, one of the comforting things that I know is that she had a, right before she passed away, she had a conversation with our mother, who I lost when I was 35 years old. We lost 
when I was 35 and Annette was uh, 33. But the nurses observed her having a conversation, full out conversation with our mother who told her to come with her. So, and then she closed her eyes and was gone. But it, it gives me a lot of comfort because I was very close uh, to our mother. Um, I was the only one, only blood relative that was in California when she passed. And I was completely devastated by that for a long time. Um, so th this doesn't feel as bad as uh, losing my mother did, but it does feel bad. Um, I'm going to miss her so, so much. And um, I just know my mother and her are up there right now watching me, loving me, um, accepting me. Uh, my sister said she never would, but she did. Um, she had the nurses call, call me by my legal name um, to let me know what was going on. And I was just devastated and overjoyed at the same time. And that's pretty much how I'm feeling these days. I'm just feeling both ends of the spectrum, good, bad, and in between. So I will uh, talk with you guys later. You have a blessed weekend and um, pollinator out.